John, woke up everybody. Um, Patrick and I are going to talk about from Dev to Ops. DevOps. Um, going to Patrick introduce himself. Hi, I'm Patrick. <laughs> um, I do some consultancy uh, work, uh, and a few years ago I got so upset with uh, going into enterprises and devs not working with operations. So uh, that got me going with uh, DevOps. So, I'm Chris, and you can Google me. Um, <laughs> so once upon a time, can everybody hear me if I don't speak into the mic? Fabrice, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. And Tom can hear me too. For record, okay, for record. This works too. Um, so what's this DevOps thing? Um, once upon a time, there was this great company and they did everything by the books. It was the perfect IT company. They had a lot of qualified people, a lot of people who actually knew what to do, like you guys in the audience. They were the expert on everything. And the developers wrote code, they wrote code, they wrote code. And when the deadline was coming up, they just threw a tarball over the edge. So, Things changed between devs and ops. They didn't like each other. They started fighting, actually slaying each other. And well, the ops said, what have you given us? We need some detail, we need some, does this need a database? Does this, how do you monitor this? What's the configuration look like? What, what kind of server do you want to deploy this on actually? And well, the reply was, ah, it's urgent. Deploy this now, this is like the biggest marketing thing we're gonna put up and TV broadcasts are live. You need to put this in production now. Ah, yeah, still, uh, did you get me the SQL schemas? Uh, how much logs do you guys expect? How many users do we expect? How can we measure how much users we have? Well, we don't know. So the dev said, look, all these ops guys, they're just blocking our work. We like, uh, we wanna just write code, put it out there, we create a real business. And the operations guys, they're just blocking us. And the ops guys like, yeah, but the devs don't know how to run stuff in production. We don't know, they don't even know how many users they have. They don't know where the database goes. They know nothing about rollbacks. They know nothing about backups. They know nothing about clustering. The real value of the company is we, because we know how to keep a system alive. And that's where the company ends up. So, after a couple of years of frustration and people not talking to each other, well, business didn't like it. Um, it's always the same fight. They fired the whole diff team, they fired the whole ops team, and it happens over and over again. So that's why we need to go from devs and ops to DevOps. So why can't we just get along? That's a big question. Um, well, I just replied to John already, because we don't drink beer and sushi enough. Um, that's actually the best way to get to know each other. Drink beer, eat sushi. But originally, IT infrastructure, well, John still thinks it's hard, but that's because he is not into it anymore, because today it's really easy, because uh, we're having fun now. But it used to be hard. Um, you know how to assemble stuff from Ikea? Well, apparently this is harder and it's more painful afterwards. Uh, hardware is painful, especially when you have to rack stuff and falls on your toes. Um, and devs don't see that. So, operations were like, we were going, going, going. We were sometimes, we need to do something, we jump. We don't do it, we don't do it quick enough. But the dev said, look, 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 let you just, should deploy this and listen to us when we do it. And well, operations didn't like that. So each time when they had to put something in production, they were like, oh, slow down. Let, let's do this next week. We don't have time, it's Friday evening. Um, how do you solve this? Well, infrastructure became more flexible. Uh, rather than having to wreck a machine first, putting it into the data center, 
we now have a zillion machines there and we just use virtualization to actually deploy stuff. Um, Patrick found out about Zen dying last year. Cool. I didn't find the tombstone yet. Uh, Amazon still didn't die, so. And with that virtualization and cloud, we actually, rather than having to manage 10 machines, we ended up having to manage 1,000 machines. And they're not all dead yet, but as this is a vampire team. Which means that today we have to manage infrastructure as code. And we cannot manage one machine by machine anymore. We have to automate stuff so that everything goes faster, faster, and faster. Um, looking at code, and John actually said, look, this is a Tomcat example. If you want to do a Tomcat, this is how you can do it. You'll first define package your requires, you then define which files it requires. And well, I need four or five more screens, but this is code. This is how you will tell a machine to do stuff rather than have stuff done yourself. And then you get a really flexible and agile infrastructure. Um, an infrastructure that really isn't doing what it's supposed to do, but it does what's more. And with infrastructure as code, you can actually rebuild your infrastructure. You can throw any machine out of the 10th floor of a building and be up and running in no time again. People have heard me say that before. Uh, you can build your infrastructure from scratch because everything is code. It's not manual work. It's not reading somebody's wiki top down and trying to figure out what's going on. It's code. We can version our infrastructure. If we want to, we can go back to the previous version because it's just a new build of the platform. Um, and we can actually use version control the way it should be, not by putting different tags into the files. And then the next thing you end up is having actual applications which you need to talk to in order to automate them. There's still a lot of work we need to do there because not all equipment has an API yet. But the next step will be that we talk to devices and we configure them using code, using their API. So everything is automated, right? You don't need us anymore. You don't need the operations guys anymore, right? Nah, of course not, because still things break and you need to control what's going on. You need to be able to predefine what's going on and somebody still has to write the code. Um, but it's more than automation. It's also about how far can you go and testing if everything you are automating is going right. If you can test everything, you can also see where it breaks. You have to measure what's going on and you have to measure how fast thing will break. So it's not about just automating, it's also measuring it, validating what you've done and trying to build an infrastructure that is fully automated and tested. Which means that because you use version control, you can roll back. You can roll forward. You can roll back. Like the horse. And you can predict what happens. You can know how much colors are going to come out. And you can know how many you'll see. Because with an automated infrastructure, things will go much smoother than without it. So brings us to how to tell it to the devs. Maybe a quick show of hands. Who, who is uh, mainly doing development as his day job? A few people. Uh, and who's operations main job? And who's doing both? OK. Uh, well, Chris explained a lot of the, the automation stuff and making things reproducible. Um, if you've been doing uh, agile development for a few years, uh, that's not something new. It's, it's something uh, within the software world that I've been trying to solve uh, for a number of years now. Um, but now that we have the HL infrastructure, something strange happened. <laughs> okay, let's skip a few slides. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da. Then comes the HL sysadmin. There's no reason why you can't apply. Okay. Who has a remote control that works? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not good news. Okay. 
Okay, the Agile scissor. Mm. Um, within Agile uh, development, we usually work with a backlog. All the things you have to do, you put it into one large list. There may be a large task and small tasks, but the idea is that you start with the things that are most important to the business. To estimate how much work uh, things uh, uh, are in the backlog or, or specific task, uh, they use a concept called planning poker, where they sit together with a bunch of people to decide how long it takes. So it's not one person saying, okay, to put that server into uh, 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 life, uh, it takes me one day to put the server on. There's probably some guys from storage there's some guys from the network who also have to be in that planning uh, to see how much work it actually is. And by doing a consensus and multiple people uh, having a look at the same problem, you will get a far better estimate on how long it takes. So you take that list and on top of the list, the most important, you try to break it down to little tasks and you try to um, deliver something working every X time. So let's say you have a, a sprint uh, of two weeks. Every two weeks, you make something working that you can show to the business. So it's not about, okay, uh, it's 95% busy, but we can't show you anything. You, you actually show something at the end of the iteration that has value to your customer. But the problem is, um, uh, I noticed that when you do in such a sprints of two weeks, when you're working operational stuff, you have the incidents coming in. And so they break your estimates initially, you knew how long it takes, but you cannot really say when you will be finished because you are uh, often interrupted by some external cause you don't have under control or a hard disk failure or electricity going down or water in the data center. Okay, uh, these things you cannot plan um, it's still, um, therefore, I found it better to work in flow. So you still keep the list of what's most important, but you also understand that there are things that are going to interrupt you and that you have to attend. And then something else, sitting together with another system administrator or another person actually gives you value thinking about a problem. Uh, we are so used to working alone, uh, the typical uh, idea is somewhere in the basement, one guy alone solves all the problems, but what happens if you, there's somebody else who comes and joins you and watches what you do? You, first, I, I noticed that you try to do your best harder because you, you cannot put things away, but also you get like a buddy to get feedback. Is that a good idea? Is it, isn't it? and you learn from each other. It's a great way of leveling expertise between people in a team too. Another way is visualizing the work you have to do. Um, Kanban is a um, very broad uh, ID, but one of the things it does very well is that you put on a wall a board of all the tasks you have to do. Probably you're already doing it with some kind of white board and things. But the great thing, people can come in into your room and they can see how much work there is to do. So if the next one comes in and says, yeah, you need to deploy it now, you can see, oh, this is all the, the stuff you have to do. And you have to negotiate what's important. And you can't do that if you don't have that list and you can't see it. So it gives like a, a better way of explaining why he can't get things uh, not immediately done. Um, the flow of getting things from the backlog to the to-do and the test and production, uh, another important concept is that might be that you limit the number of tasks in each phase. So you might have, um, well, first of all, if you see a bottleneck in your process, it's probably gonna hang a lot of these tasks somewhere at a certain stage. So you will see that there's a problem in that area. Let's say it could be that you don't have testers enough or that too many uh, applications come in the test phase uh, at the same time. So therefore, you limit the number of tasks that you start on and that go from one phase to the other uh, instead of having all tasks in a hanging state not being able to deliver. It, it gets you in a kind of deadlock if you put 
too many tasks in a certain area. And another problem I found out, similar to in the de development world, is that um, in the developers, you have the testers, the developers, the people doing the UI stuff, the database guy. Well, we need to get all the people within ops also aligned, like system uh, administrators and the storage security and the network, because they're all involved in the same process. And it's another silo, we're gonna talk about that later, but within the uh, operations, they're often split up in different groups with different cultures. So it's, it's a problem you probably have to overcome if you actually want to deliver uh, in a better way. But like I said, agile developers, they know all that. So uh, what's new to them? Um, we can all become developers now. So um, I gave that talk uh, a few uh, weeks ago and uh, they actually said, you know, we as a dev, we can just now rebuild the whole virtual machine and ship it. So we don't have to talk to uh, the operations guys. It's like a bit like John said, self-servicing in a way that they would think of, but they skipped on the important part is that um, you still have to talk to each other because the other one knows more about performance, about security and so on. So it's like, in development world, you haven't all become testers and UI people and database people. You still have to work together with people from different background expertise. And that's what actually uh, becomes uh, the thing. So you don't have to fear for a job. It's just when you automate things and you do stuff like that, it's just a way to get you addressing other things. It's not that they will just uh, make you vanish as a role. You might get a new role uh, and get involved in, in other stuff. But this is just automation we, we talked on, up until now. So it's, um, it's probably gonna help you uh, a lot in making things reproducible, but it's only uh, gonna help so much in your actual real problem. So if we go from there to uh, the next level, saying um, we have those agile infrastructure that we can all do now. Um, and within the uh, development world, there's the concept of continuous integration with the concept of, um, if it's hard, do it more often. So they rebuild their software over and over and over again. And that gives them more confidence. So um, now that we have um, infrastructure as code, we can actually try to do something similar as the developers did, because they have the cycle of going from dev to test, uh, test with their tests. And if the test fails, it comes back to dev. Uh, if the test succeeds, it goes to the next stage. Um, but there's no reason, um, okay, we all have to make these environments the same, of course, and software only brings value in production. But the main idea is that you can start up with a parallel build just for your infrastructure that you can start aligning with your software build. Um, uh, like John said, uh, the company rebuilding their whole infrastructure over and over again, they're just aligning when a new software release comes up, they combine it with a new infrastructure release and just put it out as a global thing. Um, Chris is gonna talk tomorrow about uh, shipping or creating virtual appliances. It's something similar. The software on the application uh, and the infrastructure layer as a whole that you are built over and over again. So releasing your uh, release cycles, it's not like the devs are afraid that when you are create your infrastructure, everything's gonna break for them, or when they change something, a config file, that your infrastructure is gonna break. You have tested the same release, the same, uh, uh, well, the same set uh, combined from the two worlds into the new release of production. So doing that multiple times over and over again gets you into the idea of continuous delivery. Uh, of course, there are some companies who can do that 50 times a day, 20 times a day. It's not about the actual number. It's about you thinking that you can improve the number of changes and the number of things you can do over and over again. So the actual value can be like uh, 10 days because of regulations or some manual process you have to take into account. Uh, but it's getting to the most efficient and the fastest in your world, that's important. So that's about the continuous delivery. Uh, we haven't solved all problems, of course. Um, how to package things, that's usually a debate. Um, like, well, we bundle a war, 
file in, in the, the Java world? Do we make like a package for that or not? It's, it keeps on going over and over again. We have uh, the Ruby gems. Do we create a package for that? Yeah, there's still a debate going on on that. Um, who gets the root access? Um, it's about trust, of course. Everybody, in my idea, can get the root access, but do they need it? Uh, maybe you can just expose log files or information uh, to developers or other people in your company uh, so that they don't have to ask your help to view it or that you're not uh, the almighty guy that has all the power. But exposing is, is a kind of like, again, self-servicing ID of whatever they need, information to do their job well, you start to expose them. You make sudo or whatever access and you make sure they have everything they need. Another thing um, I seem to uh, find is that when you actually hit problems, uh, developers say, oh, everything is, is in the log file. Yeah, it's a debug log file, but it doesn't, yeah, it, it, you can probably augment from warning to debug level, but it usually doesn't tell me much from what I need to have in case of the problem. It will help solve your uh, problem if it's in the code, but maybe, you have to also see like um, other dump, uh, information about uh, the number of threads it's uh, running and, and things like that. Things you don't really care uh, in the developer, but you will need into the operational world. So it's it's also something you need to be aware that uh, these two worlds are uh, merging together. So like I said, the delivery is the flow and the cycle time. How many times can you go and getting that into a steady flow and make it repeatable, uh, that's an important topic. Uh, it's not like I can rebuild my infrastructure. No, I can redeploy, I can get something changed, and I do it over and over again. Another tool that helps in that is that when you have your workflow, um, the business gets a new uh, ID, then it goes off to the analyst, then it goes to the dev, then it goes to the next one is that when you start plotting that whole workflow um, visually, you can try to discuss that uh, with the people and trying to optimize parts. So maybe the, you're used to having, okay, we need to send uh, this for confirmation to the security guy, uh, and if he's on holiday, we have to wait for, wait for two weeks, then come back. Maybe you can think of cases where you can bypass that. Let's say it's a standard change and you make a kind of things that you know the decision is gonna be like this. So it's like these kind of uh, small optimizations to your process that can actually bring you a better way of working and reducing your cycle time to get things to production. Um, waste. Um, when you're doing a lot of um, work um, we all know like, oh, we need to write a document uh, because somebody will end up reading it. Well, really, you have to question if it really brings any value and it's not something that, that lies into a closet. I know it's a thin line because uh, what looks like value to you might not be value to somebody else. Somebody else might have to create a report or do some other stuff. Uh, so you have to minimize the waste that you're actually doing in your process. So it's, um, it's very close to the lean thinking idea um, of reducing anything that uh, you're overproducing. It's a waste of energy. Things, um, this is not about not being able or uh, to fail. It's just that you have to uh, allow uh, no defects. Um, the problem is if you have a defect, um, I hope you actually are able to stop the process you're working in. Um, what I see often happening is that there's a huge problem coming up in production, but the devs keep on working on their new release. So it's, okay, what's important? Do we actually stop working on the new release and fix that bug because it's more important? Uh, it's a thin line, but we, we all know that when you fix things in the beginning of the process, it doesn't have the impact of running in production. So it's much, much cheaper to fix things at the source of the problem and in the beginning than doing it live 
when you have like uh, 10,000 users coming in and with all the pressure and all the overtime, think about that if you just uh, leave something in the open for your next release to be shipped into production. So we said about continuous in delivery, but the way we think about things is actually how can we keep on improving our, ourselves on a tool side, on a way to work together, uh, on making, actually having a better life again. And for that, we need to overcome an even bigger pain. We need to overcome that we can't really work together uh, at the, the management level decision. Uh, by that, I mean that you can do it on the grassroots and you're probably on a continuous integration you probably are discussing things on a technical ID, but you, you have to go up a level to discuss things and overcome what's important. Um, traditional management styles, in, in my opinion at least, they, they focused uh, very much on the individual, what I call the individual part of the thing they're addressing. Um, devs that try to optimize their role view like they have their customers that have to write their software and the businesses and the ops they're trying to optimize like infrastructure we don't have to uh, want to buy too much of it uh, we don't have to uh, we don't want to get more tickets uh, in the incidents and so on um, and what the result of that is that uh, just like um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term but uh, not in my backyard. So everything can happen and every problem can happen, but we hope it's the other one's world. So um, we tend to optimize our own world and just make the things we don't want happen in the other world. Um, which can actually cause your technical debt to grow. Um, a typical example of that is the cron job fix. Uh, who has done cron job fixes in production before? Okay, quite a few. So uh, memory leaks, you don't care in the development and the tests. We have all the um, infrastructure we want. Yeah, but then you deploy it and you have to fix it. Log files that keep on growing. Yeah, cron job fix. So th these th things of mentality is that when you are coding an app, you have to take into account things that will fail or uh, have another ID production. So uh, like somebody uh, said, I think it was Korzybski or something, uh, the map is not the territory. It's not uh, the world you see that is the actual uh, world. Um, <coughs> people uh, from the two parts of the, the world, like I said, they try to optimize their own world. And so you might, um, make a lot of new software releases, but in a way you're influencing and you're driving the ops to death because you're overproducing. So you put a low pressure on your world, but the high pressure is on the other world. So you, ha you have to rethink in your whole step what you're doing, what you, how you influence the global flow through the two worlds and not in your own world. And you have to understand that it's a business problem. It's not a technical problem. It's not about releasing software, not about building uh, infrastructure. It's getting some business value from these things. And I find this a very good quote in that um, doing the right thing versus the thing right. We're so focused on doing, oh, are we following procedures? Are we doing the technical stool, cool stuff? Are we doing it how we have to do it? Focus on what's the right thing for the business you have to do and the rest will follow but don't do it the other way around find uh, some new tool you like and then think of a new project you can do with it it doesn't match that way and collect metrics the bugs you have might be going down and the fail deploys might be going down but the incidents might be going up so you have to actually see these things over the whole flow, over the whole cycle of doing your software development and your deployment. So whenever you have to decide what gets priority, whether it's the new project going or product going into production, or it's fixing the incident, it's a tough call. The same thing is, are we going to go for another functional feature 
or are we addressing something like a security bug or a performance issue? From a technical kind of uh, perspective, you can't really decide. You have to relate it to the business value. Value, and that's your job. Your job is a, of course, to do the technical stuff that you're used to doing, but to also explain the risks and what can happen and will happen to the business. And that's um, something I, I often see uh, not happening: is that they just say, "Oh, you know, we we just uh, have to have this new infrastructure." Okay, how does it help me get this business going? How much? Uh, risk does it reduce? How much value can I win for that? So when you explain these things to the business, you have to advise them, but you also have to accept their decision. Okay, you can think that they're never able to decide for themselves. At least you gave the input. It's, I, I compare it with when you build a house, you, there's probably gonna be an interior designer saying, oh, you have to do this and that, and that's great, but it's your decision as a business owner who says, well, I go for that or I don't go for that. And you have to uh, comply with that as a person uh, because I've seen so many uh, times happening, oh, we need more infrastructure, we need uh, newer stuff, newer stuff, but if the budget and the outweighing for new functionality and new features um, and infrastructure it needs to be balanced. And you, from when you look at things from only one side, you cannot get that balanced view. So you have to, of course, explain it to the business, and I hope you have a business owner who actually understands his business, because it doesn't really help if it doesn't, but uh, at least you, your job is to advise him and to help him reach that uh, decision. Okay. So. Are we going to solve all the problems with DevOps? John thinks yes. <laughs> no, um, we cannot solve everything. We can solve a lot, but still, we need to talk. Um, we need to talk to the developers. We need to get involved way earlier in a project project than today. And that brings us to the next thing. Um, it's a team thing. It's a group of people who need to work together, and we need to change the culture. Um, some people tell DevOps is a job title. It's not. I tried to fool you guys uh, already a couple of times with that, but it's not. So if you see some company hiring a DevOps, they're not doing it right. <laughs> um, and there's going to be a lot of culture changes that we need to overcome. Um, it's not just hardware and software. It's about deployment. It's about measurement. It's about how to automate things. Uh, lots of operations environments don't use version control yet. The devs are doing that for the past decade. We need to learn from each other. And we need to learn from each other because basically we have the same customer. It's the business that we have to help. It's one shared goal we have to look into. It's the same business problem we have to solve. We're all looking for blood, right? So. Why do we only get together in the war rooms when things go wrong? Does anybody know? Who takes his developers or sysadmins out for dinner once in a while? Hey, one guy. Two guys. Ah, GP. Yeah, but, okay, GP, right. Um, <laughs> that's already two people who are doing it right. So why is the rest only fighting in the war room? We need to think about those things. And we also need to think about what the role of a manager is. Apart from writing reports and reporting upstream, um, they don't need to tell us what to do. We'll explain them what we want to do, and they need to support us in doing that. And for them, it's also going to be a culture shift, because they're probably not used to doing that. So <laughs> it's not about the tools. It doesn't matter if you use CF Engine, BCFG2, LCFG, or whatever other tool we didn't mention yet. As long as you do use one and you use it correctly, um, you can deploy an infrastructure with a zillion tools. Um, but the right one is the right one. And the vampires and the werewolves will have to get together. 
they will have to talk, they will have to discuss stuff over beer and food. And well, maybe I should ask John to ask in this one, but we already did. It's about culture, it's about automation, it's about measurement and sharing. And we already have a full hour of that. And we'll get to higher levels, we'll get to other people understanding the problem, where we can implement those. And we'll see that the dev, the ops, the validation people, and management will learn together. So what started out about a couple of guys wanting to automate everything, then we realized that we need to change culture and behavior, and we need to start thinking different. Well, the more you go to the right, the more effort it's gonna take to change stuff. The tool stuff is easy. It's changing how a company thinks, changing how a company behaves. That's the difficult step. But that's also the step that's gonna have the biggest impact. Um, so, we're also when we can do this. And if you wanna know more, there's more homework. Um, same book keeps coming up, basically because Patrick was part of it. Uh, you forgot that, John. <laughs> so, homework, and here's where Patrick got the ideas for the slides. Yeah, it was a discussion on the mailing list, cutting her, so that's where we got. So uh, we really want to know uh, how you uh, want to try to change things uh, in your uh, environment. So what's really worrying you? Uh, what stories do you want to come out? Because it's the sharing, the stories that actually makes this uh, very worthwhile. And tell us about your world uh, you live in and how you make it awesome. So this was our talk. Outside your coffee. Any questions? There's not a one size fits all approach. I can tell a story about uh, one of the agile companies that were having problems. They, they, so there were like a team of 150 developers and they're shoving all the time new things into operations. And they were feeling this cultural mismatch. Uh, so we started talking um, and what I found out is that it wasn't about the tools, the way to work together. It wasn't about people discussing things. Uh, at that time, it was uh, a problem because the two management roles of each department, they couldn't get along. So they each had their own budget and they tried to allocate their own perspective in those two parts. And um, the only thing I can do from a consultancy perspective is expose that problem. But uh, it's, I, I couldn't get to, let's say, the le uh, level above and say, okay, these two guys need to work together. So that, that, that's the only thing I can do at that time. Um, but it got them into thinking um, in, in some way that the pressure came from the teams and they started to do, put pressure on uh, the two uh, managers saying, okay, you need to get a line for what's important and what we can do and can't do. So it, that's something from my experience in, in going in as a consultancy because well, sometimes they say some, some outsider, it's easier for somebody outside to expose and tell the problem while you're internal, you have the internal politics. Uh, so, you know. From another point of view, um, things would 
can help to change culture is moving people physically around. What you see today is that there's the dev guys, there's the ops guys, there's the DBAs, security people are in that corner, or even on different floor, different buildings. And even moving one guy out of his comfort zone, moving a dev into an ops zone, moving an ops guy into a development zone, it's going to get them started talking. And it's going to change the way they think about stuff. Or even having a flexible desk, like I sit there on Monday, there on Tuesday, there on Wednesday. Different people to chat with, different impressions you get, and that's easy to change. Another question? Yeah. Yes. I think that one important thing too is that you must work at the team level and not at the individual level. Uh, if you want to change things just as an individual in some environment where operations or development are, are not, it's not working as a team already, uh, then um, I think it will be very difficult or quite impossible to, uh, to, uh, to make things change. Yeah. So what Fabrice is saying is that it's not one person who can change it. It's not a title. So you really need to get the whole team involved and change stuff at a whole team level. That's right, right? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Okay. Enjoy your coffee <laughs> while it's there. <laughs>